Thank you, Conti. I'm happy to return to this conference. Thank you for the invitation to speak about PI3 kinase inhibitors. And we're all, of course, aware that this remains a key pathway in CLL downstream of the B cell receptor as well as mi multiple microenvironmental signals. And the enzyme itself consists of a P85 regulatory subunit and P110 catalytic subunit. The catalytic subunit comes in a variety of isoforms, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. And most of the development in B cell malignancies, as you know, is focused primarily on delta because of the evidence for its role in B cell signaling and development. And I'm going to focus my talk primarily on adelalisib, which is a delta inhibitor. Although there are a variety of other inhibitors coming out now that have different specificities. For example, copanilisib, recently approved, is a pan inhibitor with some greater emphasis on alpha and delta. And there are two drugs in CLL registration trials, which Dr. Flynn will discuss, duvalisib, which inhibits both delta and gamma, and umbralisib, or TGR, which inhibits delta, as well as casein kinase 1 epsilon. So what about adelalisib? Just to remind you, it does potently inhibit its target in vivo, as demonstrated here by inhibition of phospho-AKT from patients in the initial phase 1 study, as well as inhibition of cytokine levels. And this resulted in an excellent PFS in patients with a median of five prior therapies of 32 months in those who were treated at the recommended phase 2 dose. So it was a very effective drug. And in the upfront setting, in these data from Susan O'Brien, in which a, in a company-sponsored study, they looked at adelalisib plus rituximab in patients over 65, you can see that the response rate was essentially 100 percent, CR 19 percent in all comers and 33 percent in 17 p deleted patients, with a PFS of 83 percent at 36 months. So this is really a very effective drug. So what's happened? Why aren't we using it more? And as you know, this relates to a pattern of toxicities that we've become increasingly familiar with. You can see in the phase one in the very heavily pretreated population, the incidence of these toxicities was fairly low, 6 percent diarrhea colitis, 2 percent transaminitis. There were a few cases of pneumonitis, though. When we look more broadly at the entire registration program, which Dr. Kay presented a couple of trials from that registration program, at over 700 patients in the column called overall relapsed, where the patients had a median of two or three prior therapies. We see that the incidence of these common toxicities goes up to 14 percent for the diarrhea colitis and transaminitis, 5 percent for the rash. And just to hone in a, a bit more on what we consider this toxicity profile that's typical of adelalisib, in the first one to two months, we can see transaminitis, which in the relapse setting is often self-limited. If you hold drug, it will resolve, and you can often restart at the same or lower dose successfully, as shown here, where three-quarters of patients were rechallenged and mostly successfully. Rashes can occur more or less at any time, sometimes earlier, a little bit later, and again, hold drug. Sometimes steroids are needed, but again, most patients could be rechallenged and often successfully. <clears throat> the somewhat more problematic toxicities have included a drug-related pneumonitis, where you see many fewer patients were rechallenged and which often requires steroids to resolve once you've ruled out infection. And then in particular, the grade 3 diarrhea and colitis, which is a late event, as I'll show you shortly, and sometimes is recurrent when you start the patient back on drug, or perhaps most of the time is recurrent when you start the patient back on drug, unless you have them on chronic steroids, or we often use budesonide uh, with a long, slow taper to reinitiate the drug. And so the steroid responsiveness of many of these side effects suggested the idea that they were autoimmune, which we'll be talking about throughout this talk. And then just to underscore the fact that some of these events are late, the pneumonitis occurred at a median of four months on drug in this relapse refractory population, and again, these data presented by Steve Coutre at EHA a couple of years ago. And the diarrhea occurred at a median of seven months, although it can actually occur at any late time, even after a couple of years on drug, and in my experience is sometimes triggered by an infection, that a diarrheal infection like C. diff or a bacterial infection that they may, may then segue into the more inflammatory autoimmune diarrhea. So we looked a couple of years ago at two of the registration trials, the Adela Rituxin and the Adela Ofatumumab registration trials, with two-year follow-up at how many patients remained on drug. 
And what you can see here is that only about one in five patients, 20% of patients, remained on adelalicib. But this was not due to progression, which occurred in only 13% of patients. It was primarily due to adverse events, which occurred in 41% of patients. And the survival curves associated with that are shown here. The blue one is for patients who discontinued due to adverse events. And you can see there's an early sharp drop off, which is due to serious infections, pneumonias very commonly, and actually similar to the curve that we saw earlier today in the WIAC updated data from abrutinib discontinuing patients. But then after that, it flattens out and survival is better. Whereas those who can discontinue for progressive disease in the maroon have a continuous drop off in survival. And so those data from the registration trials contribute to the bottom three lines, the lower section of this table, where the patients previously treated, if we look across those registration trials, you can see that the Adela patients had improved overall survival compared to the control group which is probably because the effective benefit of disease control in that setting overwhelmed the adverse event or infectious problem. But what happened when Gilead stopped most of their upfront trials a year and a half ago is illustrated on the top part of this slide where there was a small increase in death in the adela containing arms compared to the control arms in less heavily pretreated patients whose disease was presumably not as severe at that point. There are also a couple of bendamustine rituximab combinations here, and many of the opportunistic infections, particularly CMV, are more prominent in the bendamustine rituximab combinations. And the, the trials had not mandated careful monitoring and prophylaxis for these infections, hence this result. And most of those deaths were due to bacterial infections and sepsis type events, which I think arguably actually it, it's clear from the prior studies that that was a risk, which is shown here for the phase one, the summary relapsed cohort presented by Dr. Coutre, the company initial studies, and then our upfront study, which I'll be telling you about. You can see that there's grade three, four neutropenia in 40% of the heavily pretreated patients, but even 25% of the previously untreated patients getting Adela alone or with an antibody had grade three, four neutropenia and some febrile neutropenia, as well as grade three, four infections. And you can see opportunistic infections are scattered throughout the trials at the bottom. And so there's this infection risk, which is higher in at least some of the upfront trials. But the autoimmune toxicity that we started out by talking is also higher in some of the upfront trials, as shown here, where in the company-sponsored trials under the initial therapy column, colitis ranged from 27 to 42 percent, depending on follow-up in the O'Brien and Zelenitz cohorts. Transaminitis in about a quarter and rash in 13 percent. And we saw similar findings in this phase two study that we had initiated at Dana-Farber with two months lead-in on Adelalisib followed by the addition of ofatumumab. Over half the subjects had grade three, four hepatotoxicity, mostly around week four, associated with an activated T cell infiltrate on liver biopsy. The vast majority of them required steroids to resolve this process, not just drug hold. <clears throat> and if one wanted to attempt to reinitiate the drug, one had to do it in the presence of steroids. And so this illustrates how the subjects broke out. About half of them had this early hepatotoxicity at a month. And then half of the remainder had more typical adelalisib toxicities that we see in the relapse setting, while the other half of the remainder had absolutely no problem at all at the bottom. And so it would be really good if we could identify prospectively who the patients at the bottom would be who have absolutely no problem at all. And so in this trial, the predictors of having the severe toxicity included a younger age. 100% of the subjects under 65 needed steroids for toxicities as well as, interestingly, a mutated IGHV. And I'll come back to some hypotheses about why this might be. We've had the opportunity to look across the registrational program in collaboration with Gilead at the incidence of transaminitis of grade three or higher as a function of treatment status, and that's shown here. And you can see that this summary analysis does clearly confirm that the untreated patients had a significantly greater rate of this 
grade three or higher toxicity compared to the relapsed refractory patients. One of the studies included in this analysis was also presented by Peter Hillman at EHA this year. And this was a frontline phase two study in 17 P patients who were intended to get Adela at the usual dose with rituximab. And this study was closed at the time of the safety announcement a year and a half ago when the patients had a median exposure of six months. They had a median age of 66. And you'll note that they're almost all unmutated. Only 13% were mutated, which is consistent with the fact that the 17P deletion was required. The toxicity was similar to what we've seen for the other upfront studies, 37% grade 3, 4 neutropenia, 41% transaminitis, and 19% grade 3 infections. And so in this study, if you look at the cohort by age less than or greater than 65, you can see that there was not a significant difference by age within this cohort, but that the overall incidence of transaminitis was higher compared to the other company-sponsored upfront study restricted to patients over 65. And so again, in the entire Gilead registrational experience, we looked by age for the incidence of the grade three or higher transaminitis. And you can see here that actually very clearly by decile of age, starting from those under 55 with the highest risk for the grade three transaminitis up to those over 75 with the lowest, that there's a very clear age dependence of this effect similar to what we had seen in our study. And potentially consistent again with an autoimmune mechanism. In the 17P study, they tried to look at mutational status as a predictor, as we had done in our small study. And you can see that there is a trend toward a higher evidence of this toxicity in mutated patients, but the numbers are very small, so it's hard to tell for sure. So what is this all about, this immune-mediated toxicity with a delta inhibitor? So I think everyone's probably heard now about the connection between P110 delta and Tregs where mice with kinase dead delta develop an autoimmune colitis and have decreased numbers and function of regulatory T cells. Mutations that disrupt Treg function in mice and humans lead to autoimmune syndromes that look a lot like what we're seeing with adelalis, hepatitis, enteritis, and pneumonitis. And so in this work done collaboratively with Shui Dong and Amy Johnson, who was at Ohio State at the time, you can see that the kinase dead delta results in a significant reduction in regulatory T cells in the setting of the TCL1 mouse model of CLL. And so we looked at this also in our patients. And in fact, 73% of the subjects on our upfront DFCI study who we looked at with matched samples had a decrease in their regulatory T cells over time. And this was significantly greater in the patients with toxicity after therapy shown in the right panel in red compared to those without toxicity in blue. We started delving into this a little bit more with more extensive profiling on the patients with and without toxicity. And one result of that is shown here. These data were done by Barbara Sherry in collaboration along with Jackie Barrientos, where we do see an increased prevalence of intracellular expression of, the IL of IL-17 and CD4 and CD8 cells in patients who develop the toxicity and at the time of toxicity. And this is a pathway generally associated with autoimmunity. And we're working to expand this analysis to more patients at present. So the hypothesis would be that decrease in Tregs as well as more active IL-17 leads to the autoimmunity. Now what about IGHV mutation status? How does this relate? So we don't know for sure. We have two different hypotheses. One is that the unmutated patients have much lower IL-17 levels, and in fact our own patients as shown in the left cohort. The other hypothesis is that regulatory T cells have been reported by multiple groups to be more expanded in CLL patients with unmutated disease, and that those patients may be relatively protected by starting out higher. You can see that that's not a statistically significant difference within our small, small cohort on the right. And again, these are issues that we're trying to pursue in larger cohorts to better understand this. So where does this leave us on the pitfalls? So, PI3 kinase inhibitors are a highly active drug class, still much needed in B-cell malignancies. And Dr. K showed you the data from the registrational trial with rituxan, where the median PFS is 19 months in patients with very high CR scores, short remission durations previously, and a high incidence of 17P deletion, also with no difference based on IGHV or 17P. 
Adelalisib, I think, is a prototypical delta inhibitor with the pattern of immune-mediated toxicity that remains unpredictable and can be severe. We now have pretty good data based on the registration experience with the Gilead trials that younger age and less prior therapy predispose to this toxicity. And we have less data, but we're working on more for IGVH and decrease in Tregs. Mouse models support this as an on-target effect. And so this is one category of toxicity one needs to be very careful of with adelalisib, the autoimmune toxicity, always suspecting it whenever a patient on therapy for any length of time has diarrhea, for example, or pneumonitis. The other key categories of toxicity to watch out for are the neutropenia and sepsis that led to the discontinuation of the upfront trials, and opportunistic infections. Patients all require prophylaxis for pneumocystis, viral infections, and monitoring for CMV. So where does this leave us where we're using PI3K inhibitors now? So I think current settings are as a single agent in relapse patients intolerant of BTK inhibitors or in relapse patients who've progressed on BTK inhibitors, although this is a context in which the activity of the drug is not well established, as we've already heard today, that the cysteine or PLC gamma mutations are not well studied in the context of PI3K inhibitor therapy. And so where I think about this drug is in older, more heavily pretreated patients who are definitely at less risk for toxicity. And if they have significant comorbidities that may impact BTK inhibitor tolerability, usually cardiac. And for the future, I think we have a few options. We can identify a biomarker for tolerance, figure out who that quarter of the patients in our study who had no toxicity at all is. We could try an alternative schedule. Copanilisib, for example, has a punctuated schedule. And we don't have much data at all with that in CLLs yet. Or we could do an induction and then a punctuated schedule for maintenance. Or identify a rational combination partner to mitigate the toxicity. And that is obviously more complicated. And then I'll just point out that the immune activation of these delta inhibitors does represent an opportunity to use them as anti-tumor immunomodulatory agents, potentially even in solid tumors. And there are studies in the UK in which that is actually being done. Thank you. <laughs>